Uh, my name is Michael Grandy. I'm a professor at uh, Providence College. Uh, this semester I'm teaching uh, MBA 603, which is accounting and decision making in organizations. And today's uh, discussion is going to be a PowerPoint presentation. And we're going to be looking at uh, chapter four. And this is from the um, managerial accounting, Garrison, Noreen, and Brewer, 17th edition. It's their PowerPoint presentation for chapter four, and specifically talking about process costing. And it's, it's a, actually a very good PowerPoint presentation. And in a subsequent YouTube uh, channel video, we're going to look at some, some problems that talk about process costing. And um, let me pull up the um, presentation. We can uh, get started. Um, bring this over here. From the beginning. And more importantly, I need to share my screen. because not forget to do that. It's happened in the past. And um, so at this point, you should be uh, seeing the screen. Um, and we're talking about uh, process costing, chapter four. And uh, this is really uh, managerial accounting from Garrison, Noreen, and Brewer. So let's, let's talk about um, comparisons between job order costing and process costing. We just finished a chapter. Well, what we've done is we looked at job order costing and we looked at um, activity-based costing. And activity-based costing was simply a much more refined method of allocating manufacturing overhead between two products. We initially started talking about job order costing using a single predetermined overhead rate. We then went to activity-based costing and we used multiple activity rates in terms of allocating manufacturing overhead between our two products. But process costing is, is different because it works with different types of products. So let's, let's talk about the similarities first. Both systems assign materials, labor, and overhead costs to products, and they provide a mechanism for computing unit product costs, cost per unit. Both systems use the same manufacturing overhead accounts, including manufacturing overhead, raw materials, work and process, and finished goods, okay? The flow of cost through the manufacturing accounts is basically the same in both systems. Please re let's remember, the flow is raw materials, work and process, manufacturing overhead, finished goods, and then cost of goods sold when it's sold. So those are the big accounts where costs, product costs, are flowing through the accounting system. Now, let's look at some differences. Job order costing. Many different jobs are worked on during each period, with each job having unique production requirements. So let's think of you know, a couple of different, different scenarios, right? Uh, a, a house builder, some a company building houses, that's job order costing, where each house is different, each house has different specifications and may have different prices and costs of materials. We can also look at a furniture company that makes uh, desks versus wine armoires versus dining room furniture, tables and chairs. So different, uh, different products. Process costing, a single product is produced either on a continuous basis or for long periods of time. All units of product are identical. They make exactly the same thing over and over and over again. There's no, no change. Maybe it's something like you know, tubes of toothpaste, or maybe it's you know, a speaker system. Maybe it's uh, you know, anything that's repetitive in nature, same exact item over and over again. Going back to job order costing, costs are accumulated by individual job, and we saw some examples of that. The costs associated with job A, the costs associated with job B, the costs associated with job C. Materials and labor are different for those things. 
and accordingly the overhead may be different depending upon how it absorbs resources within the factory. Process costing. Costs are accumulated by department. So it moves from department A to department B to department C. So the cost of the product is moving through the system, but costs are accumulated by department. So number three, job order costs and unit costs are computed by job on a job cost sheet. And we saw that. Whereas process costing, unit costs are computed by department. And we're going to see some great examples. Here's a quick check. Process costing you use for different products that are similar and produced continuously. Process departments. Any unit in an organization where materials, labor, and overhead are added to the product. The activities performed in a processing department are performed uniformly on all units of production. Furthermore, the output of the processing department must be homogeneous. Products in a process costing environment typically flow in sequence from one department to another. Department A to Department B to Department C. Learning objective number one, the flow of costs. We've seen this before, right? Product costs, direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead are all accumulated in a product cost account called work in process. When it is completed, the costs then move along to finished goods. When the product is sold, the cost moves to the income statement in an account called cost of goods sold. We can see this in our job costing system. We are maintaining job cost sheets in addition to these general ledger accounts. We have jobs where we capture this information. In process costing, the same exact things, materials, labor, and overhead, except costs are traced and applied to departments in a process cost system from one department to the next department until it is completed at such time as it goes to finished goods. The purpose of this example, assume there are two departments, Department A and Department B. We will use T accounts and journal entries. You're going to find that these are very similar to what you saw in job order costing. So I'm not going to spend too long with them. Here you can see materials are coming out of raw materials account, right? It's a credit going into work and process. Department A versus Department B. There's your journal entry. So we're capped, we have departments, we have uh, general ledger accounts, one for each department. That's the only difference. Again, with regard to direct labor, we're gonna put it into the department accounts. And again, we've got two separate accounts for those. Same thing with manufacturing overhead. Keeping track of costs, we are accumulating costs by department which we did not do in job order costing. And again, we, as, as the product moves through the system, so we build up costs in department A, materials, labor, and overhead. When it is completed, when, it's, when the costs move, when it's transferred out, it's transferred to the next department where then there are additional materials, labor, and overhead applied. So the cost builds up in Department A. When it's completed in, in, in Department A, it moves to Department B, along with its cost, where additional costs are added. That's the transfer of costs to, job, to Department B from Department A. Once it's completed, once the product is completed, from the last department, it's moved over. The cost of goods manufactured is moved to finished goods. Again, very similar looking journal entry. And then when the product is sold, it's going to go into the cost of goods sold account and out of finished goods. Again, when it is sold. 
In process costing, each department needs to calculate two numbers for financial reporting purposes. The cost of its ending work in process inventory and the cost of its completed units that were transferred to the next stage of production. The key to deriving these two numbers is calculating unit costs within each department, cost per unit. This is something you're familiar with from financial accounting, ending inventory. So another important concept, there are two methods for performing the computations, the weighted average method and the FIFO method. We are only gonna cover the weighted average method. Characteristics of the weighted average me me method. This method makes no distinction between work done in the prior and accounting prior in current periods. It blends together units and costs from the prior and current periods. The equivalent units of production is very important. The equivalent units of production for a department are the number of units transferred to the next department or finished goods, plus the equivalent units in the department's ending work in process inventory. Equivalent units is very important. Conversion costs. And we were exposed to this in the very first chapter when we started talking about managerial accounting. Conversion costs are how do we convert raw materials to a finished product? Because remember, there's three components, direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. How do we convert? What does it take to convert raw materials to finished product? It takes two things labor and overhead. So direct labor costs are often small in comparison to other product costs and process cost systems. Therefore, the direct labor and manufacturing overhead are often combined into one classification of product costs called conversion costs. So we're really gonna be just working with two types of costs in process costing. That is direct materials, and conversion costs. Those conversion costs include two things, direct labor and manufacturing overhead. <clears throat> Equivalent units, defined as the product of the number of partially completed units and the percentage completion of those units. Equivalent units need to be calculated because a department usually has some partially completed units in its beginning and ending inventory. These partially completed units complicate the determination of the department's output for a given period in the unit cost that should be assigned to it. Let's think about this. At any given point in time, specifically at month end, there are going to be some units that are not completed. That's the reality of the situation because the, the month end is a moment in time. If we are continuously producing something, there's gonna be a, a lot of units that were completed and transferred to the next department, but there's always going to be some units that are only partially completed. So we need to convert that partially completed unit to a, per, to a number of units, equivalent units of completion. Equivalent units. Equivalent units equals the number of partially completed units multiplied times the percentage of completion. Equivalent units is the product of the number of partially completed units and the percentage completion of those units with respect to the processing in that department. The equivalent units is the number of complete units that could have been obtained from the materials and effort that went into the partially complete units. Here's an example. Assume department A has 500 units in its ending work in process inventory that are 60% complete with respect to processing in the department. These 500 partially complete units are equivalent to 300 fully complete units, right? 500 incomplete units, which are 60% complete, therefore it converts to 300 complete units. Department A's ending work and process inventory would contain 300 equivalent units for the period. Quick question. For the current period, Jones started, started 15,000 units and completed 
That means they're all done, 100% complete, 10,000 units, leaving 5,000, right? They started 15, they completed 10, that means there's 5,000 left over, which are 30% complete. How many equivalent units of production did Jones have for the period? So it's gonna be the 10,000 that they completed plus the percentage completion of those 5,000 units. So you got 10,000 plus 5,000 times 30%, which is 11,500 equivalent units. Compute the equivalent units of production using the weighted average method. So here's a nice example. Smith Company reported the following activity in the assembly department for the month of June. So they started the month of June with 300 units, 300 equivalent units, right? Units started in production in June, 6,000. Units completed and transferred out, only 5,400. So there were work in process, 900. Now, what's important here is this is very similar to financial accounting and inventory, right? Beginning inventory plus units started has to equal what was transferred out plus ending inventory. Work in process at the beginning. Beginning work in process, 300 units. The number of units started was 6,000. That's 6,300. The number of units completed and transferred out were 5,400. Ending inventory, 900, right? So it's 300 plus 6,000 is 6,300. Units transferred out, 5,400. Ending work in process, 900. That's 6,300. Those have to add up. Those numbers, work in process, June 1, that is not equivalent units. That's number of units. But see, you also see percentage of completion. So it's very important that you understand that concept. Beginning inventory plus units started has to equal units completed and transferred out plus ending inventory. Begin by calculating the equivalent units completed and transferred out of the assembly department. There were 5,400 units, right, that were completed and transferred out. But now we have to account for equivalent units. There were 900 equivalent units that were 60% complete with regard to materials. Let's go back and look, right? 900 units, 60% complete with regard to materials, but only 30% complete with regard to conversion costs, which includes direct labor and manufacturing overhead. So we have equivalent units, materials of 540, and yes, we have 270 equivalent units for conversion. Those same 900 units, they don't change, but there's only 30% complete. So here's my equivalent units for materials, 5940, and my equivalent units for conversion. Equivalent units of production always equals the units completed and transferred plus the equivalent units remaining in work in process. That's essentially what this worksheet tells us. Just another way of looking at equivalent units of production for materials, equivalent units of production for conversion. Compute the cost per equivalent unit using weighted average. So this information has to be given to you. And it said that the items in black we have already seen before. Beginning work in process, 300 units. Here are the costs that were incurred for those items that were in beginning inventory. Production started during June, production completed and transferred. Here are the costs that were added in June. So the numbers on the top, those top blue numbers, those were the costs that carried over from the previous month. These next set of numbers, cost added to production in June, those are the new costs in June. And you also know, again in black, the ending work in process were 900 units, but it was only 60% complete for materials and 30 for conversion.
So again, we're trying to calculate cost per equivalent unit. So using weighted average, the cost per equivalent unit equals the cost of beginning work and process inventory plus the cost added during the period. Those are costs divided by the equivalent units of production. We already have those numbers. We have the denominator. We just calculated those. We calculated one for materials and one for conversion. And those dollar amounts come from this screen, right? Beginning plus what was added, right? Beginning plus what was added. Here are the numbers that come from that chart, total costs. The beginning numbers, the numbers that carried over from the previous month for materials, and then the new costs added. Equivalent units were provided to you. Cost per equivalent unit, simple division. Now we need to assign the costs using the weighted average method. So those are the costs associated with the ending inventory. Here are the costs associated with the dollar amounts transferred out. So remember, the, the costs that were in ending inventory stay in that department and go to the next month, but these costs that transferred out go to the next department. So those transferred out costs, we saw a journal entry earlier. Let's assume this is the, assemb this is the assembly department, right? So you, got, you would have a journal entry that said something like debit, and it moved on. Let's assume it goes from assembly to finishing you would have a debit to work in process finishing on materials and conversion of 194,400. And you would have a credit to work in process assembly for 194.4 because you're transferring the cost from one department to the next. Prepare a cost reconciliation using weighted average method. So these are the costs that we had. Cost of beginning, right? Materials and conversion, 10,039. Costs added during the production period of June. Again, materials plus conversion, 209,790. Here's how we assigned those costs. We assigned 15,390 to work in process, and we assigned 194,4 to what was transferred out. Let's go back and look. See the 194.4? That was transferred out. 94.4. So there are four important steps with regard to process costing. Four things you need to do. You need to, number one, compute equivalent units of production. Number two, I'm sorry, you need to, number one, number one is compute equivalent units of production. That's what I meant. Number two, compute the cost per equivalent unit. Okay. Number three, assign the cost to the units. And number three, prepare the cost reconciliation report. So there's four things you need to do. So we're going to take a look at some problems in my next video that will help you understand it. I'll stop sharing that. Thank you very much. We'll end the session.